Asmat Guru Bion Maha, Asmat Parama Guru Bion Maha, Asmat Salva Guru Bion Maha. So we're continuing on with our discussion of uh, the book Vaishnavism by SMS Chari. And uh, it's a, we, we, we basically covered the preface and we're up to the introduction. So let's have a look at the introduction. So, um, religion and philosophy have been an indispensable part of Indian culture from the remote past. The Rig Veda, which is the oldest religious literature in the world, together with the principle of Upanishads. When we say principle of Upanishads, we mean that there's there's a there's a Muktika Upanishad, which is the last of the list of 108 major Upanishads. There might be some other Upanishads. I think about there's actually I think a, a book printed with 200 Upanishads in it. But normally we think of the 108 as being the ones which are listed in Muktika Upanishad. Um, if you look in, in, in the ISKCON book, Chaitanya Charamrita uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami gives, uh, gives a list of these 108 which come from Muktika Upanishad. <coughs> and that's usually accepted. And then uh, out of those 108, the first 10 or 12 are considered to be the principal ones, which are normally... Uh, part of the Prasthana Triad, which are the basic axiomatic books which are, of Vedanta, which are commented on by the different Acharyas, studying this, that system of uh, comment, commenting on the Prasthana Triad, uh, was started by Adi Shankar Acharya. So anyway, he, the Rig Veda, he's talking about the Rig Veda here and the, and the principal of Upanishads, contain profound philosophical as well as religious thoughts, which have provided the foundation for the later development of philosophical and religious, religious systems of, of India. The philosophy and religion in India are not totally separate from each other, right? So in the West, sometimes we see that there's philosophy and religion and they're actually separate sort of uh, disciplines. But in India, philosophy and religion tend to go together. They have grown together as complementary to each other. The major philosophical schools which have, uh, which have accepted the authority of the Vedas, right? So these schools are called astika. Sometimes you hear people use the word astika and nastika. Some people will use the word nastika, na astika, not astika, as, being, as meaning atheist. Nastika doesn't actually mean atheist. It means just that they don't, the people who are nastikas don't accept the authority of the Vedas and the Upanishads. If you accept the authority of the Vedas and the Upanishads, the Shruti, or what we call Shruti Pramana, then you're called an Astika. So there are these six principal schools of Indian philosophy, which are Astika Darshanas, which accept the Vedas and the Upanishads. So the major philosophical schools which are accepted, which have accepted the authority of the Vedas are Sankhya, Yoga, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Purvimimamsa, and Vedanta. Purvimimamsa is also called Karmakanda. Vedanta is also called Uttara Mimamsa. So Purva means first part, Uttara means second part. Some Acharyas like Ramanuja treat Purvimimamsa and Uttara Mimamsa or Karmakanda and Vedanta as two parts of the same thing that basically we look at the Vedas and we see different parts of the Vedas. We see the Karmakanda section, we see that the Vedas were used for sacrifices and rituals, but also there's a philosophical aspect to the Vedas. So they, we see, they, Ramanuja sees them as one, one tradition like that. Whereas Adi Shankaracharya rejects the Purvimamsa, he rejects the ritualistic parts of the Vedas, right, the Karmakanda section, and he, he vehemently um, uh, argues against following the, the Purvimamsa. The word mimamsa means deliberation. So the first deliberation, the second deliberation. When we come to the Brahma Sutras or the Vedanta Sutras by Bhadarayana, otherwise known as Veda Vyasa, the, uh, the first one is Atato Brahma Jigyasa, right? Atato Brahma Jigyasa, it starts out with Atta, meaning a new, uh, there's a new, when you start with Atta, it means there's a new subject. Atato Brahma Jigyasa, right? 
there are other sutras which start out atato dharma jigyasa, right? So jigyasa means an inquiry into. So thus, now an inquiry into the supreme. Yeah, and pro and crying to inquiry into Brahman, Tato Brahma Jigyasa. If we inter if we're interested in Dharma, interested in Karma Kanda, interested in ritualism, right? Or uh, you know, performing sacrifices and things, then we would start at the beginning of the Purva Mimamsa Sutras, which are, I believe, by Jaimini, right? Who is another great sage like Veda Vyasa. And so in the, in the beginning of that part, it says Atato Dharma Jigyasa. So what does Atato Brahma Jigyasa mean? It, it means now that you studied, first of all, you studied the Karmakanda. Now you can study the, the uh, first of all, you study the rituals. Now you study the meaning of the rituals. Now you study the meaning of philosophy. So, okay, so that's the meaning of those two different, um, two different mimamsas or two different schools of deliberation. The Purvamamsa and Uttruvamamsa, otherwise known as Karmakanda and Vedanta. So they are two. Now the other, the, the those go, those two go together sometimes, and then sometimes also the the other the other four also appeared off in two too. So yoga and sankhya sometimes go together, and there's two types of sankhya. Sankhya means simply counting; it's empiricalism, right? So, uh, and some parts of sankhya are accepted. The, the theory of evolution of, of matter and everything like that is accepted by Vaishnavism in general. And, um, and so there's two types of Sankhya. There's Nirishwara Sankhya and Seishwara Sankhya or Saishwara Sankhya. So there's, there's Sankhya, which is just materialism, material, uh, you know, understanding about matter, the evolution of matter. And then there's, then there's another form, Saishwara Sankhya, which, which believes that God started the process of creation. So, so you can either, you can study either. Uh, both of them are said to be by uh, a sage called Kapila. Some people think there's two Kapilas, one, one for Nirishma and one for Saishma Sankhya. Okay, um, we, that's another topic we can go into sometime. Yoga, the Yoga Sutra is by Patanjali. Patanjali has, has spoken about us, uh, uh, Astanga Yoga means eight-limbed yoga, where, um, asana, um, asana, pranayama, dhyana, etc., etc., up to samadhi. There are different steps. Nyaya means logic, by sheshika. Nyaya, so yoga and sankhya go together. Nyaya and by sheshika, they sort of also go together. Purva and Uttama and Mamsa go together. Okay, so these are called saddarshanas, categorized as saddarshanas, or the six Darshanas, or the six systems of Indian philosophy, right? The ones that are called astika that that um, that accept the Vedic, the Vedas as authority. Buddhism and Jainism, which are also part of Indian philosophy, because Buddhism and Jainism both arose in India, uh, fall outside of this group, uh, and they as they do not acknowledge the authority of the Vedas. They are called Nastika, Nastika schools or Nastika darshanas, right? There's also another one. There's a, there's may, there might be a few others, but uh, but there's one other principal school that falls outside and rejects the Vedas as an authority, and that is called Charvaka, the Charvaka or the the atheistic, the Indian athe the Indian type of atheism, right? Which is called Charvak, after the after the Rishi or the person who propounded it, Charvak. Charvaka. Okay. So the Vedanta system comprises several schools. Now we're talking about the Vedanta system. So out of all of these schools, all of the ones that don't accept the Vedas, all of the ones that do accept the Vedic authority, the Vedanta, the last one, they all fought against each other. The, the, the Acharyas, the teachers of each school had different disputes over the millennium, over many years like that. Ultimately, what we see in India today is an acceptance of Vedanta, right? In modern Hinduism, the, the underlying philosophy behind the modern religion Hinduism is Vedanta, right? So the Vedanta system comprises several schools. There are different flavors of Vedanta, right? So um, several schools uh, which have arisen as a result of different interpretations 
offered by the exponents, by the exponents of the Upanishadic texts, the Vedanta Sutra and the Bhagavad Gita, the triple foundation of Vedanta. Again, this is called Prasthana Triya. The three basic texts that we read and we understand commentaries on, if we want to know the axiomatic truths behind the Vedanta philosophy. The principal ones among them, right, the principal commentaries on these three texts, what are the three texts again? They call Prasthana Triya, Triya means three, Prasthana means basic texts. Vedanta Sutra, the Vedanta Sutras, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Upanishadic texts. So first of all, the Upanishadic texts are Shruti. They're the end of the Vedas, the Vedanta. And they, they give all sorts of philosophical principles, but not in a particular order. So in order, order to order them in different, under different subject headings in a, in a chronological way, Badarayana or Vedavyasa, he wrote the Vedanta Sutras, which are small aphorisms, which, which are then commented on by different acharyas of different schools of Vedanta to give, to explain their philosophy in detail. So each of the sutras is, is different quotes from the Upanishads are, are put underneath each of the sutras, right? And the whole thing is, is put into one book called Vedanta Sutra with a commentary by Ramanuja or a commentary by Madhva or a commentary by Shankara. And accordingly, according to which, which, um, which parts of the Upanishads they bring in for each sutra, we get the understanding of the sutra. So the Upanishadic texts, the Vedanta Sutras, and the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita from the Mahabharata is one of the two main uh, aspects of the, of the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata is known as the fifth Veda by many people. It's, it's an itihasa or a history, uh, and it contains... The Bhagavad Gita, which is its most important uh, aspect, which is uh, Lord Krishna's instructions to Arjuna on the battlefield, which uh, comprises of him teaching Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, and Sharanagati or property or surrender. surrender. And, uh, and also um, the Vishnu Sahasranama, the thousand names of Vishnu, which also can be deeply understood to give a commentary on on all of the on all of these uh, subjects of Vedanta, so all of the names have meanings. So, so great acharyas, starting with Shankara Acharya, Adi Shankara Acharya, have commented on all of these texts. They've written commentaries on on the principal Upanishads. They've written commentaries on the Vedanta Sutra. They've written commentaries on Bhagavad Gita, and the, and they've also written commentaries on Vishnu Sahasranama. So normally we don't include Vishnu Sahasranama, and we just say Prasthana Trayi. But actually, there's like four things there, not just three. The principal ones, among them, the principal commentaries on these texts are the Advaita, or non-dualism, of Shankaracharya. That's, a, that's one, one flavor of Vedanta, one type of Vedanta, one school of Vedanta, one Vedanta darshana. Darshana means a way of looking at the world, right? Uh, Vishishta Advaita of Ramanuja. Vishishta Dvaita means differentiated non-dualism, or it can also be called pan, uh, pan, uh, panentheism, or it can also be called holistic non-dualism, let's say, right, of Ramanuja, right? And the Dvaita or the non-dual, uh, or the dualism, the dualism of, uh, of Madhva, right? So these are the these are these are the three main schools. Now there are other schools too. There's a school of of there's Nimbarka school and Chaitanya school and and uh, and Balabha school, Vishnu Swami school. Different diff, different people have their other slight differences on Vedanta, but these are, there are principally three ways of looking at 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 the, at the knowledge that comes in the Upanishads, the Vedanta, right? That comes in the Upanishads of Brahma Sutras and the Bhagavad Gita. So there's three ways of looking at it. Either, either people believe in, in oneness or they believe in difference or they believe in some combination of oneness and difference between the three principles that, that Vedanta is about. The three principles which Vedanta is about are the Vedantic principles Chit, Achit, and Ishwara. Chit means the individual souls. Achit means matter, the universe. 
and uh, and Ishwara means God, the Supreme. Right. So there, is, there are several religious cults of ancient origin, right? So here we're talking about the fact that, that in India, religion and philosophy are somewhat connected. In the West, sometimes they're not connected. They're, they're completely separate things. But uh, in India, there, there'll be a philosophical school. There'll be a religious outlook or a theological outlook that goes along with that philosophical doctrine. So, for instance, we just talked about the Vishishta Dvaita of Ramanuja. So there is also a, that Vishishta Dvaita of Ramanuja is Vaishnava Vishishta Dvaita. It's a type, it's a, the, 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 concept, the conception of God in Vishishta Dvaita of Ramanuja is Sriman Narayana. Now there's another, there's another person, <coughs> we, may, we may encounter a uh, discussion about him a little bit. Uh, his name is Srikara, who came after Ramanuja. He liked Ramanuja's philosophical outlook of Vishishta Dvaita, uh, qualified non-dualism, and he therefore, he therefore took it, but he was a Shaivite. He liked Shiva rather than Vishnu. So what he did was he, he decided to have a type of Shaiva Vishishta Dvaita. So whereas Ramanuja is a Vish, Vaishnava Vishishta Dvaita, there's also a Shaiva Vishishta Dvaita. So don't, let's not get confused. Vishishta Dvaita is the philosophy. Vaishnavism or Shaivism on top of it is the theology. So you can have the a same or similar philosophy, philosophical doctrines, but the theology may be a little bit different, right? Just like we find that there are Vaishnavas in India who worship Krishna exclusively or worship Brahma exclusively or worship, you know, some other form of Vishnu exclusively. And then there are others, others who, you know, who, go, who worship all different forms of Vishnu like that. Anyway, we'll get to that. So um, the sects which are referred to in, in later religious literature are, for instance, Vaishnavism, where Vishnu, is, Vishnu and his different avatars, his different expansions, his different uh, forms are worshipped as supreme. Shaivism, where Shiva is, is worshipped as supreme. Shaktism, where Devi or the mother goddess is considered supreme. Um, Solya, where the sun, the, 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 the devata of the sun, Savitur, right, is, is considered supreme. Vinayaka, Vinayaka, uh, Vainayaka, which, in which Ganesh is considered supreme, and Skanda, where um, Kartikeya or Subramanyam, or in Tamil is called Murgan, is considered supreme. So normally in North India, they don't include Skanda, but Skanda, uh, Skanda or Kartikeya or Subramanyam, he is considered quite, um, he's quite popular in, especially in Tamil Nadu, in South India. So that's why. You sometimes you see this referred to as five, and sometimes you see it as six different schools, right, of, of theology. The, uh, right, so sometimes, sometimes it's called what we call panchopasana or pancha, panchayata, right, which means the five. The five would be Vishnu, Shiva, Shakti, Surya, and Ganesh, right, leaving out Skanda. And sometimes it's called Shanmata. Sanmata means six, the six, six ways, six different, um, six different uh, religious paths or, or theologies, right? Which, and in which they include uh, Subramanya or Skanda, like that. Okay. So um, then you have people who follow Adi Shankaracharya because of their philosophy of Advaita. They, Shankara um, says that, he tells his followers that you can worship any or, or you can worship all five or all six of these. So it's very common to see the smartas who are Advaitins, non-dualists, they who follow Adi Shankaracharya. It's very common to see them worship all five. And whichever one they feel is favorite to them, whichever form of God they feel is favorite to them, they keep in the middle. And then in the corners, in the four corners, in the four directions, they worship the other four. So there are smartas who have Vishnu in the middle, smartas who have Shiva in the middle, who have Devi in the middle, Surya in the middle, Ganesh in the middle, like that. Um, there may be, also smartas might be worshipping Skanda. So, okay, so these are the different theologies, which are on top of the philosoph philosophical layer, the philosophical layer of basic doctrine. 
Right, coming from the Upanishads, right? So, okay. So then of these, the principal ones, which are well-developed. Now, not all of these schools are well-developed. Like if you go to India and you search for Vaishnavas, you'll find them. If you search for, and you'll find several different schools of Vaishnavism. If you, search, if you search for Shaivites, you'll find Shaivas and you'll find several different schools of Shaivism. You'll find several different schools of Shaktism. You'll, it, you'll, it'll be very hard to find any schools at all of, soul, of, of sun worship, Suryism, or uh, Vinayakism. They get this, the worship of these deities tends to get, to get absorbed in some of the other ones. So those people who worship Surya or Vinayaka or Ganesh or Skanda as supreme, they're usually incorporated in, in some of these other um, theologies. So the major, the major, <clears throat> the major, uh, okay, so again, to summarize, the major philosophical schools are Advaita, Dvaita, and Vishishta Dvaita. These are the major philosophies. The major theologies are Vaishnavism, Shaivism, and Shaktism. Now, they, that, they don't correspond to each other, right? So there might, as I said, there's a school of Shaivism, which is Vishishta Dvaita. There's a school of Vaishnavism, which is Vishishta Dvaita. There are schools of Shaivism that are Advaita. There are schools of, there, you can say that there are some people who follow Advaita who love to worship Vishnu also, like that. Normally, we don't call them Vaishnavas, but because, because they don't have, because this Advaita philosophy is, um, it, at its root, it's a, it's a little bit inimical to, to, um, to normally what we understand as Vaishnavism. And so, therefore, um, the difference between philosophy and theology. So, like, for example, we, um, we would understand uh, in philosophy that there is a soul and there is God, right? Now, we understand that we, we, we are t the soul is meant to serve God. That's a philosophical principle. Okay. But what, what God should we serve? Okay. So if we, if we decide that we should serve, lovingly serve Vishnu, then we become Vaishnavas. And more specifically, somebody, some Vaishnava sect might say, we want to serve Krishna. We want to serve Rama. We want to serve Narasimha. We want to serve Sriman Narayana. These are all forms of Vishnu. So they're all Vaishnava sects. But Vaishnavism is the, the, is the theology or specifically Krishnaism or Ramism or, or, or Narasimhaism or Sriman Narayanaism, whatever it is. Whereas somebody else may agree. He may agree with the, the, Vaishnavas, the Vaishnavas in a philosophical way. He may say, yes, we are a soul and we are meant to serve God and God is Shiva. And somebody else may also agree, we are a soul and we are meant to serve God and God is the mother goddess. Lalita, Mother Goddess Ambika, Mother Goddess uh, Parvati, right? So, so, so therefore, the theology is the different names of the name of God, you know, the, or the form of God that we worship, and the and the and the all the culture and all the tradition that goes along with that. Because, for instance, we have in the Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya, we have great saints called Alwas, and they and they and they had mystical experiences of God, and they prayed to God as Sriman Narayana, and they thought of God as Sriman Narayana, like that. Okay, there are 12 of them. There are 63 Shaiva saints in Tamil Nadu, Tamil saints called the Nayanars. The Nayanars, those Tamil saints, they also spoke of God in Tamil, but the God they're speaking of is Shiva. So they, 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 have a, they, they may or may not, they may or may not have the same sort of philosophical basis, right? But their theology is different because they see God, they see God as Shiva. Uh, other people see, there's a, there's, a, there's a statement, I'm not sure exactly where it's from, we can find it out, but Yam Shaiva Yamapasati Shiva Iti Brahma Iti Vedantinaha. It says that those people who see 
God as Shiva. Some people see him as Shiva. Some people see him as the Supreme Brahman. Some people see him as Arhat. The Jains see him as Arhat. We can say the Christians see him as Jehovah or, or, or Christ. Uh, the, the Muslims see him as Allah. You know, whatever it is. Whatever it is. People have their different theologies. But let's investigate some, even the Buddhists. There are some Buddhist sects that worship Buddha as God. He's a type of God. Bo original Buddhism doesn't believe in God, okay? But there are Buddhist sects today that worship Buddha as God. They worship Buddha as God. They chant Buddha's name, and they are going to go to Buddha's heaven. Uh, they want to go to Buddha's heaven and serve Buddha after death. It sounds very much like Christianity or like certain forms of Vaishnavism or like, you know, some other religions. It's just if you just change, if you just change the, the words from, you can just change Jehovah, Allah, you know, uh, Christ, um, just change any of the words that you use for God to, to, uh, to uh, Narayana, Krishna, or Shiva, or whatever it is like that, you get a different theology. But the underlying, the underlying philosophy is, yes, we are individuals, we are, we are the sons of God, and we are serving God. So philosophy and theology are two different things like that. Now, first of all, we should understand philosophy and we should accept philosophy. We, we may have a lot of other people who agree with us on philosophy, but they don't agree with us on theology. There may be different Vaishnava schools, and some Vaishnava schools exclusively, they want to worship Lord Rama. They say worshiping Rama is the best. And there's another school, they, they worship Krishna, and Krishna is worshiping Krishna is the best. Like that, and as the, and Krishna is the most important. Krishna is the original. Krishna, is, everything is Krishna. And then there are other other forms of Vaishnavism where Sriman Narayana and uh, you know or Purushottama. There's some. There's like this. So this is the theo theological um, construct which is put on top of the philosophical basis. So that is the difference between philosophy and theology, which is very important to understand. So we, so what we're going to, Vaishnavism is made up of not only theology, it's not just a, a religion, but it's also a philosophy underneath it. Yeah. So it's, there's not just theology, there's also a philosophy which underlies that theology. So we can, we can, we can, we can give you the philosophical basis of Vaishnavism without even saying the word Narayana or Vishnu. We can just say God and we can explain it like that. Nobody will think that we are Hindus either. Right? We just talk about God and the relationship between God, the world, and the souls. That can be a discussion. And, 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 and then at the end, somebody may ask, well, okay, so who do you call as God? And somebody may say Shiva. Somebody may say Vishnu. Somebody may say, you know, Jehovah or Allah, whatever it is. So these are theolo this is theologies on top of philosophy. So now, as I said, in India, the theology and philosophy tend to come together like that. Sometimes in the West, philosophical discussions are separated from theologies or religions. Ramanuja's system specifically is a, and, and many of the Vaishnava, the Vaishnava systems, even the Shaiva systems or whatever, they are theologies of, they are religion, they are, they are philosophy-based religions. So some religions are just sort of religions, but, but if you look at the, at the basic the basis of them, they don't have a they don't have very logical or consistent philosophical basis, right, when we look into them. But, but Vaishnavism does. Okay, so here we're talking about Vaishnavism. Like that Vaishnavism is not just the religion of worshipping Vishnu, but it's also a philosophy underlying that. Now, there, are there may be several people who call themselves Vaishnavas. In a sense, you can call Shankaracharya Vaishnava. He prayed to Vishnu. Bhaji Govindam, uh, he, uh, he, he wrote a Narasimha Karavalambada Stotram. He prayed to Lord Narasimha, a form of Vishnu. He prayed to the, uh, the uh, Govinda Krishna. He prayed, you know, there, he, there are several devotional songs. He admits in his Bhagavad Gita commentary, right? We have the commentary here, the philosophical commentaries. Why, why is it that the philosophical commentaries include the Upanishads, Right there are Shaiva Upanishads, Vaishnava Upanishads. There's different types of Upanishads that seem to have, seem to have, uh, to be, uh, seem to be about a particular deity. Whereas the Bhagavad Gita is, how can you, 
how can you have a Shaivite interpretation of Bhagavad Gita? Krishna is obviously a form of uh, an avatar of Vishnu. He's obviously a form of Vishnu, right? Or Narayana. So how, you know, if you're saying Bhagavad Gita is, is, uh, is the essence, is one of the essences, are there Shaivite schools which, which, which recognize that Bhagavad Gita is a main scripture? Yes, a Shankaracharya is not a Shaiva, but he accepts Bhagavad Gita as Prasthana Trai. And there are Shaivite schools that accept Bhagavad Gita as a basic philosophical text too. But in that case, they're not emphasizing the fact that Krishna is an avatar of Vishnu, but they, they're, asked, they're emphasizing the, philosoph the philosophical portion of Bhagavad Gita over and above the person who actually spoke it. So you will find commentaries. It's, very, they're very, it's sort of difficult to dissociate the, the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita from Vaishnavism, but you can. There are non-Vaishnava interpretations of Bhagavad Gita, for sure. Okay, so now, so therefore, the Gita itself is a philosophical text. It's also considered a Vaishnava text. Adi Shankaracharya, he, some people say, some people mistakenly I think that Shankaracharya is a shy, but he's not. Shankaracharya is a worshipper of God. His idea of, of the su Supreme Brahman, he calls it the Supreme Brahman, the Great Spirit, like that. He sees Krishna and Shiva and Devi, he sees them all as being, you know, forms of God, different forms of God. And therefore, when he reads Bhagavad Gita, he also accepts. And in the very beginning of his, of his Gita Bhasha, he says, Narayana Pravyaktat. He says, Narayana is supreme. Shankaracharya admits it. He accepts it like that. So, so anyway, just to get back to it, the point is that, that philosophy and theology come together and we should understand that they are slightly different things but normally they come together. So we're going to be discussing Vaishnavism, which includes the, the theology of Vishnu worship on, and the philosophy of Vedanta on top of it. Now, somebody else may have a religion which combines the philosophy of Vedanta, but with Shaivism or with Shaktism or whatever like that. Okay, so there's these two aspects. Okay, so, um, so mostly, mostly the big schools of theology the major schools of philosophy are Advaita, Vishishta Dvaita, and Dvaita, right? Monism, qualified monism, quantified monism, quantified non dualism, and, and dualism, right? Okay, they're the, they're the major philosophies. The major theologies are Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktism. Okay, like that. And you can combine those in different ways. Uh, the the other two major living religions that have their origin in India, right? So if you go to India and you say, you find people and you say, okay, what religion are you? You're going to find Vaishnavas, Shaivas, and Shaktas, right? You're also going to find people who follow Shankaracharya who say they're smarters and they believe in all of it. They, 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 don't, they don't have a preference to what theology they believe. They believe in Advaita Vedanta and they don't have any, they might have a personal preference, but they don't, they don't uh, enforce the worship of Vishnu or the worship of Shiva or the worship of Ganesha or whatever on anybody. That's, that's your personal preference. They, they'll go with anything. They're called smartest. Okay, so then, which strictly speaking means they, they're very strictly following the Shmiti Shastras, which are, it's, you know, more detailed scriptures to tell us how to live our lives and, and in a particular society. Some, some rules are not applicable today, but some are. Okay, so... So, uh, and to a certain extent, all Hindus are smartest because they all follow the Shmiti Shastras in, 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 to a certain extent. Even the Gaudis will say, Shruti, Shmiti, Purana, the Pancharatra, the Vidam. We follow all these, these scriptures the Shruti, the Shmiti, the Pancharatra, the, Pur the Puranas, the Ijasas. These are all considered scriptures for most Vedantins. Some people, like Shankara, they reject Pancharatra. You know, some, but, but everybody accepts the Vedas. Everybody accepts some other scriptures like the Puranas and the Itihasas, you know, etc. Okay, so apart from all of that, we have two other, the two other uh, Gnostic religions, the ones that don't accept the authority of the Vedas, called Jainism and Buddhism in India. We still have Jains and we still have Buddhists in India, very few of each, right? But these two do not owe any allegiance to the Vedas, as we said before. It is customary to call the religion of the vast majority of Indians as Hinduism. 
right? So without getting into all the details that we just discussed before, people just lump it all. They say, okay, they're Hindus. And they make a distinction between Hindus, Buddhists, and Jains. So the Gnostic religions are uh, the Gnostic religions are kept out, and the Asika religions, the ones that follow the Vedas, are Hindus. People follow the Vedas; they Hindus soon. Hindus will say this themselves: Sanatana Dharma. We have an eternal religion. We follow the Vedas. We follow some some interpretation, some understanding of the Vedas. Maybe they don't follow the same understanding, but that's detailed information. So um, it's customary to call the religion of the vast majority of Indians as Hindus or the religion of the Hindus as distinct from Buddhism, Jainism, Buddhism, Jainism Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which all find their, which all find adherence, other major religions of the world. You, you will find today, you will find uh, Muslims and Christians and, and Jews also in India, right, like that. But that, they, that those Abrahamic religions uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, in that or in that chronological order, all came out of the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran, etc. Which uh, they're all called Abrahamic traditions, and they came from the Middle East and they were introduced into India. Whereas the homegrown religions are those religions we talked about mainly: Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktism, and Buddhism and Jainism. And of course, there's uh, Indian atheism as well. But it's not, we don't call atheism a religion exactly, although we could, but it's not usually called, called a religion. It's called a lack of religion. Okay, so Hinduism itself does not stand for any specific creed. So th this, is, this is why a lot of people, they say, well, don't call me a Hindu, call me a Vaishnava, or call me a Shaivite, or call me a Shaktite, you know, or call me a Ramanandi, call me a Sri Vaishnava, call me a, you know, Swami Narayan, whatever it is. Be more specific. So Hinduism is a very general term. So Hinduism itself uh, does not stand for any specific creed. It includes several cults, each with a distinctive character and devoted to the exclusive worship of a specific deity as the supreme being. Though the various religious cults have, uh, do have certain commonly accepted doctrines um, and may be regarded as a part of Hindu Hinduism in a broad sense, they're all identifiable as distinct. So there are all these different schools of Hinduism. Each one, and Hinduism is just a, it's just a general term to lump everybody in who follows, who basically follows the Vedas, not like that. Um, each, one, uh, each one is a well-developed uh, religious system with a long historical background and claims millions of followers. The Comprehensive and separate study of each religion, therefore, would merit a closer study. Of course, this book here, we're talk going to talk about Vaishnavism. We're not going to talk about Shaivism, Shaktism, or any of these other um, uh, Hindu uh, sects. So we're going to, we're going to, there's enough, there's enough different sects in Vaishnavism for a whole book. So that this is what this book is about. Vaishnavism which is the main subject of this study, is one of the oldest living religions of India. It is basically a monotheistic system based on the theory that Vishnu is the ultimate reality, the supreme deity. In Sanskrit, that's called Paratattva. Tattva means principle, para means the supreme, so the supreme principle, and identical with the Brahman, the word Brahman. Brahman means the great one, right, the, the great spirit, right, of the Upanishads. So whenever we look in the Upanishads and we see the word Brahman mentioned or the the concept of Brahman being mentioned by different names, the Vaishnavas consider that to be Vishnu. They identify that with Vishnu or Sriman Narayana. It, it believes that, in, that the exclusive and devoted worship of Vishnu will lead to the attainment of the highest spiritual goal, right? And the highest spiritual goal in Vaishnavism is moksha or liberation from this material world and union, some sort of union, some sort of loving relationship with God in God's place, which is also called Paramapada or Sri Bhagavan. Right. It emphasizes the observance of an ethical and religious way of life for the purpose of realization of Vishnu. Right. So again, we get this idea of Jnanat Moksha from knowledge, from realization comes liberation. And therefore, this is what Vaishnavism. Now we're talking about all types of Vaishnavism here. All types of Vaishnavism here from Ramananda to Gaudiya to Nimbarka to Vallabha to, to 
you know, uh, Swami Narayan to Sri Vaishnava to all types of Vaishnavism. They all teach this principle of, of learning and realizing what is who is Vishnu and, and, and our relationship with him and, and achieving liberation in that way. Vaishnavism is not a mere cult. It is essentially a philosophy of religion. It, was developed, it has developed distinctive theological doctrines, which are founded on sound philosophical theories, right? So theology, which is based on philosophy, right? Enunciated in the Upanishads. So the basis of the philosophy of Vaishnavism, again, because we accept the Vedas comes from the Upanishads, and the, the, the theology of Vaishnavism, right? The actual practice of the religion of Vaishnavism comes out of principles that, from the Upanishads. There are re religions, which are, again, the oldest, the oldest known scriptural, you know, um, texts. There are religions which do not have a rational philosophical basis. Believe it or not, there are some people who follow certain theologies and religions which really don't make a lot of rational, uh, conventional, you know, philosophical sense. The tribal religions, the older Pashupata, Pashupata is a type of Shaivism, Pashupata sects. The word Pashu is the word that they use for the soul. Pashu means an animal, right? So we're all like animals, so they consider the soul to be an animal. And the Pashupata, is the is the is the controller of the animals or the or the um, protector of the animals or the, the the owner of the animals is Shiva. Shiva is the Pashupata. So it's another name for Shiva, Pashupata. So the Pashupata sects are, are types of Shaivas. Right. So the tribal religions, the older Pashupata sects, and some of the revealed theologies are of this type. They don't have a rational basis actually when we look at them. So some people who follow those religions, they may object to that characterization that their theology isn't rational, but okay, we can talk about it and we can discuss it. On the other hand, we have metaphysical systems. Metaphysical systems means philosophies, right? Such as Madhyamaka school of Buddhism, right? So when we say Madhyamaka, there are, there are four original Indian schools of, of of Buddhism, Yoga, Charas, um, Shokrantika, um, Madhyamaka, and mm, I forget the fourth one, but anyway, so Madhyamaka is one of them. Madhyamaka probably the most um, successful of the schools of Buddhism. And now Buddhism was driven out by, by Shankara and the later Acharyas, basically driven out of India. And it went all over Southeast Asia and it's very popular. And there are some Buddhists in India still, but mostly they have come back to India with uh, with more modern sects. Really, we don't find anybody who's who's following the original four, any one of the original four sects of, of Buddhism still. Okay, so Madhyamaka school of Buddhism and the Western schools of thought, which are not included in them, uh, which are, which do not include in them a theology. Okay, so there are some Western schools of philosophy. So like. Um, uh, we have Socrates, we have uh, Aristotle, we have Nietzsche, we have, we have all these Western philosophers, Descartes, you know, we have people who, who had, were philosophical, they had philosophical musings, they had philosophical ideas, they wrote them down, but they never really made a religion out of it, right? Like Nietzsche's existentialism, there's a type of, there's a, there's a philosophy called existentialism, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, what, uh, Jean, Jean Paul Sartre and Nietzsche, Nietzsche, you know, like these people have written about existentialism. Okay, so French philosophers and stuff. So, okay, so, but there's no real religion based on that. There's no theology attached to it. It's just a, a philosophy. Okay, so, so, all right, so, so these things like Buddhism, you know, and, uh, and these Western philosophy, some Western philosophical schools don't have a theology attached to it. A philosophical system, however great and acceptable it might be, would lack practical value if it cannot re regulate the religious life of human beings, right? So what is the point of being, you know, like if you're a communist or a socialist or, or a capitalist or something like that, just because you're a capitalist, the capitalist capitalism doesn't tell me whether you're what religion you are. 
So I'm sure that there are people who are, you know, Buddhists and Hindus and Jains and whatever, but they're also capitalists. So that's, that's their, that's the, they have an underlying, they have some philosophical principle, but, the, but it's detached from their theo theology, right? Okay, in the same way, a good theological system without a phil philosophical foundation might, might influence the life of an individual through a religious discipline, right? A good theological system, a good religion, right? Would, without a philosophical foundation, right? Doesn't have a really deep philosophical foundation, like we dare say, like some of the Abrahamic religions, like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. When we look at their philosophy, but look at them philosophically, they, have, they might have some philosophy, but they might not be very deep. They might not have any very deep philosophical um, musings. So, okay, so we can look at that. They might have an influence on the life of an individual through a religious discipline, but they might la lack a sound and coherent and consistent philosophy. A sound religious system must, therefore, be structured on a strong philosophical foundation. Vaishnavism as a theological system preeminently fulfills this criteria. So Vaishnavism is both a uh, both, has both a strong philosophical basis and a strong theolo theological basis. As a philosophy of religion, it attempts to fuse religion and philosophy and reconcile the claims of revelation and reason, right? So, so sometimes, we have, sometimes we have these religions where somebody in the religion has some revelation. God appears to him and tells him something like that. Like that, like uh, Mo uh, God appeared to Moses as a burning bush and told him the Ten Commandments. So where do the Ten Commandments come from? We, they weren't thought about logic, you know, they, if we go through them, are they all logical? Are they all consistent? You know, are they all philosophically sound? Like that, nobody cares because, because Jesus, you know, Moses just went up to a mountain, a burning bush appeared to him, and he thought, that's God, and God told me these Ten, these ten uh, Commandments. So nobody questions those Ten Commandments because they're the word of God, they're a revelation. So sometimes you have these, these things in different religions where there's a revelation. There's a revelation to a, a, a saint or by an avatar of God or whatever it is like that, and you just have to accept it. And whereas there also should, you know, Vaishnavism is such a thing that not only is there a revelation, but there's also reason. There's also is this also a reason? This brings us to the idea of how to understand the truth in Vaishnavism is normally by, by observa observation, by empirical observation, which is called protection. These are different ways of understanding true knowledge, right? This is a, the epistemological outlook of the Vaishnavas. By, by uh, empirical you know, understanding, by obs observation, by sense perception, by inference, by logical reason, Right and under, and 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 logical inference, right and by uh, revelation, revelation from the great saints' meditation, or from the rishis' meditation in the Vedas, or from the or from the scriptures themselves, right from the word of God or the word of great saints of great authorities, which is called shabda. So we have pratyekshanamana and shabda. These are three methods of learning the truth, like that. Those are accepted in Vaishnavism. Okay, so for the basis, the basis of the above claim is that Vaishnavism is an outcome of Vedanta as enshrined in the Upanishads, the Vedanta Sutras and the Bhagavad Gita, which we call the Prasthana Triad, again, the three basic texts. The Vishishta Dvaita Vedanta expounded by Ramanuja, which is the type of Vaishnavism, right, which is essentially a philosophical system, provides the philosophical foundation of it, for it, for what? For Vaishnavism, right? Traditional scholars do not generally make a distinction between Vishishta greater philosophy and Vaishnava religion, right? Traditional people. But there is a difference. There's a, there's a slight difference. According to them, the Vishishta greater Darshana is, uh, as it is, rightly known, uh, like the Nyaya Darshana. Nyaya means logic. There's also, a, there's also a school of logic. Remember these six schools? So one of them is logic, one of them is Vishishta Great is, is Vedanta. Vishishta Great Vedanta is a type of Vedanta. Is not different from the Vaishnava Mata. Ma, Vaishnava Mata means the Vaishnava religion um, uh, or theology, as it is generally termed. 
Besides, in Indian philosophy, in Indian philosophy, philosophy and religion are not treated as different from each other, uh, as is done in the West. The two are complementary, and they often overlap. Nevertheless, we have to admit a distinction bet between what I prefer to call Vishishtadvaita philosophy and Vishishtadvaita religion. The former represents a theoretical and systematic study of the nature of reality, whereas the latter covers the practical way of life, which will lead to the realization of the ultimate spiritual goal. The main theme of the Upanishadic teaching, as summed up in the three significant words, right? Three significant words. True knowledge of Brahman, of the Supreme, right? Should, should lead to the attainment of Brahman. True knowledge of Brahman should lead to the attainment of Brahman. We can also say jnanat moksha. From knowledge of Brahman comes liberation, right? Here, he's given another phrase from the Vedanta, is brahmavit apnoti param. Brahmavit apnoti param. Brahmavit means from knowing Brahman, from knowing spirit, from knowing what is spirit, what is not spirit, knowing about spirit, understanding spirit. Apnoti, will, we will attain, right? Param, the supreme. We will attain the supreme. So Brahmavit Apnoti Param, true knowledge of Brahman should lead to the attainment of, of Brahman. Right. It thus emphasizes the ultimate value of philosophical pursuits as the attainment of Brahman. Right. Keeping this in mind, the sage Vyasa or Bhadarayana, as he's known, usually when you talk about the author of the Vedanta Sutras, you talk you call him Bhadarayana, uh, because the word Vyasa, the word Vyasa simply means compiler or editor. Like that. So when they say, oh, Veda Vyasa, he's the person who took the Vedas, which were originally one book, right? One sort of one, one whole, one teaching called the Ekayana Shaka. The Ekayana Shaka. It, it was originally one thing and was divided up into Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, Atarva Veda. Okay? Like that. So Vyasa didn't write the book. But he edited the book. He, 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 he divided up the knowledge into different portions like that for easier comprehension like that. So, uh, uh, so, the, so keeping this in mind, so he was a compiler. So he also compiled these sutras, these different aphorisms, philosophical aphorisms or philosophical, uh, small philosophical um, sentences which were very, very terse, very, very difficult to understand and needed a commentary to understand them, right? And, and he has written those. So keeping this in mind, the sage Vyasa, which just means the compiler. So uh, otherwise, sometimes we talk about Vyasa, Veda Vyasa. We talk about Vyasa, the compiler, Veda Vyasa, the compiler of the Vedas, Krishna Dwaipayana Vyasa, the compiler who, who, was, who was dark in color and who was born on an island, right? Right, and or sometimes we also call him Badarayana. Badarayana, that's also a name for him. So Badarayana is the author of the Vedanta Sutras, right, has divided his reputed treaties uh, containing aphorisms into four parts or four, uh, four chapters. The first part, the first chapter of, of, of the Vedanta Sutra, right, deals, primarily deals with the nature of ultimate reality, termed as Brahman in the Upanishads. Right. So uh, to maintain the rigor of metaphysical character of the subject, the sutras do not identify the one ultimate reality with any of the deities accepted as God in the religion of the various cults with the different names. Do we understand that? So if you look in the Vedanta Sutras, it doesn't say Krishna is God, Srimanarayana is God, Rama is God, Shiva is God, Durga is God. It doesn't say any of that. It'll simply talk about Brahman, the Supreme. It'll say the Supreme. It'll use the word, if it uses the word God, it uses the word Ishwara, right? So, which is a blank word, you, you know, and different religious schools will say that that means, that means Devi or that means Shiva or that means Srimanarayana, like that, okay? So the, the sutras themselves don't indicate, they do not indicate, um, you know, that, that God is any particular deity from any of the particular theologies, right? Because we're talking philosophy here. In, to maintain a religious big, uh, rigor, the metaphysical character of the subject, the sutras do not identify the one ultimate reality with any of the deities accepted as God of the religion by various cults with different names. 
This is in the spirit of true philosophical investigation, which does not bring in theological concepts. So, for instance, we could sit down with people from other religions and we could talk philosophy without mentioning the name of God, without mentioning the particular name of God that each religion has. So without saying Jehovah or Allah, or without saying Buddha or without saying, without saying Krishna or Shiva or, or Devi or Sriman Narayana, we can sit down, we can talk philosophical principles with people. Ultimately, if we arrive at the truth, we will understand philosophical principles and we'll look, we'll look for the person who best fits that. The personality that best fits that ultimate truth is Sriman Narayana, okay, is Vishnu. So that's the contention of the Vaishnava schools, right? And of course, the Shaivites think Shiva, it's Shiva and, they, and the Shaktas think it's Devi or whatever. So the second, uh, so this is in the spirit of true philosophical investigation, which does not bring in theological concepts. The second part is primarily concerned with the reestablishment, right? The second chapter he's talking here about of the Vedanta Sutra, he's explaining about it. Is primarily concerned with the reestablishment of the same truths expounded in the first part by way of refuting schools, rival schools of thought. So, first of all, the first chapter of Vedanta Sutra, Badarayana or Veda Vyasa, he, point, he says, What is Brahman? What is the Supreme? In the second chapter, he says, What is not the Supreme? There are people out there who have these ideas in different philosophical schools, and, and, and this is why they are wrong is given in the second chapter of the Vedanta Sutras, right? Explains how they are wrong. The third part is focused on sadhana, sadhana. Sadhana means what? means the process, the process of attaining the Supreme, right? So we remember also that we, that we, can, divide up, uh, we can divide up into three or into five the different uh, subject matters in spiritual life. Tattva Hita Purusharta is the way to divide it into, into, into three. And we also have the Arta Panchaga, which we won't go into right here. But there are, there's a way of making that three expand into five um, subjects, right? So the three subjects are Tattva, principles, Hita, the process, and Purusharta, the goal, right? So here, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the third. The third part is, is based, is, is about, the first two parts of Vedanta Sutra, the first two chapters of Vedanta Sutra are about tattva. The middle part is about hita, the method, the methodology, right? We've also used the word upaya, the means to liberation, the means to attaining Brahman or understanding Brahman, right? The means of realizing the ultimate reality. The fourth part of the fourth chapter, remember there's four chapters in Vedanta Sutra, the fourth part is about, right, is devoted to a discussion of the goal, of the spiritual goal, the summum bonum. Summum bonum is uh, Latin for the greatest good, right, uh, of human life, the purusharta. Purusharta means also the, the arta, the goal of people, purusha, of, of man, man's goals, right, human beings' goals. The two topics, sadhana and purusharta, which are covered in chapter three and chapter four of the Vedanta Sutra, are very important because they spell out the practical value of philosophical study, right? So we have in the first two chapters, it's all theory in Vedanta Sutra. It's what is the Supreme and what is not the Supreme, right? And the third and fourth chapters are most important because they tell us not just what is and what isn't the Supreme, what is, what is and isn't God, but how to attain God and what is the ultimate. What is the goal that we're trying to attain? It's very difficult to attain something if you don't have a, a goal in mind. You have to understand the goal, and that helps you to attain the goal, right? Uh, we say in English, eyes on the prize. If you don't know what the prize is, you can't put your eyes on the prize and you won't get, get the prize like that. If you don't, if you, when you aim a gun, you have to have a target. When you aim a weapon, you have to have a target to, to hit. So without the target, how are you going to hit the target if you can't see it? So you have to know the goal, and then you, and then you can figure out how to get to the goal. Like that. So that's what three and four, chapters three and four of Vedanta Sutra are about. Sadhana. So two topics, sadhana and purusharta, right, or the way and the goal, are very important because they spell out the practical value of the philosophical study. Sadhana or discipline involves an ethical and religious way of life leading to the achievement of the spiritual goal. 
this, in my opinion, is the character of a true religion, right? A true religion should be based on chapters three and four of the Vedanta Sutra. It needs also one and two, but as a philosophical basis, but most importantly, the religious part of any religion has to have three and four, has to have the, a way, has to have a goal to achieve and has to have a way to achieve that goal, right? Thus, both philosophy and religion are important as they are complementary. Mere philosophy as speculative thinking and intellectual e exercise is of little practical value. Mere religion based on faith with a set of beliefs and ritualistic practices will not be rational. The two should be in harmony. The religious texts use the terms jnana and karma, right, or knowledge and action, in a broad sense to cover theoretical knowledge gained from a study of the sacred text and its practical application for achieving a spiritual goal. As an ancient verse states, Mere jnana without karma is useless. Knowledge without action is useless. And action and mere karma without knowledge, right, jnana, is equally futile, right? So he's given this in a footnote. Uh, we'll find the footnote later at the end of the chapter here, at the end of the thing. Okay, so both are therefore important. How Against this background, we have, under, we have to understand the difference between the philosophy of Vishishtadvaita, darshana, the darshana is the philosophy, Right, the way of looking at the world, and the religion of Vishishtadvaita or the Vaishnava Mata, the Vaishnava religion. Right. So there is a view that Vaishnavism is a religion, as a religion has developed primarily from the Vaishnava Agamas. Now, there are two Vaishnava Agamas, the Pancharatra Agama and the Vaikinasa Agamas. What do I mean by Agama? Agama means like a tantra. It means a way, a, a way of worship, a way of, a way of reaching him. Right? Tan triate, you know, or that, that triate means to deliver him. Tan means him. So the way, the way he is delivered or the way we're delivered to him is tantra. Okay. So the number or the numerous uh, Pancharatra treatises, more than the, the, num uh, the numerous Pancharatra treatises, because in Vaishnava Agamas, there are two there's, uh, extant. There's the Vaikanasa Agama and the Pancharatra Agama. So Mostly the Pancharatra Agama is, is, is um, emphasized here, right? It's the particular, particular method that most Vaishnavas use to worship Vishnu. More than, more than the, okay, so the numerous Pancharatra treatises, more than the Vedanta text. So this is, there's a view. Somebody has a view that like all Vaishnavism is, it's just tantric. It's just a, it's not philosophical at all. It's not based on Vedanta. It's only just, it's only just these, uh, these uh, rituals that are given in the tantras to worship Vishnu, and there, there are rituals to worship Shiva and rituals to worship Devi, so what's the difference, right? Some scholars believe that there existed in the ancient past a Bhagavata religion, a Bhagavata religion. Okay, Bhagavata is also a type of Vaishnavism, right? Bhagavata religion or religious practices of the Bhagavata who worship Bhagavan Vasudeva, right? So there's some ancient uh, columns and ancient inscriptions in India that talks about the Pancharatra and Vasudeva Sankarshana Pajimna Aniruddha as different forms of God and the worship of Vasudeva, Vasudeva as the Supreme, right? And some scholars, some mostly Western scholars, feel, feel that this was separate from Vaishnavism. This, this was separate from Vishnu worship and that Vasudeva was a, was a different deity like that. It's, the, it's not correct, but, you know, this is the idea of some scholars, Okay. So, or the religious practice of the Bhagavatas who worship Bhagavan Vasudeva and that Ramanuja imposed this religion onto, he took that theology and fused it with the Vedanta of Vishishtadvaita, right, to make the two, to fuse the two to make a philosophy of religion. This is the opinion of some Western scholars, okay? Well, we don't accept this. This analysis may be true to some extent, but it does not invalid, I mean, we understand that in, in the modern Sri Vaishnava sect or the Sampradaya, right, of Ramanuja, following Ramanuja, there is this influence of Pancharatra. So for, for sure, Pancharatra was a separate school. It was a separate school from, it was a separate, like Sampradaya, it was a separate thing. Okay, so yes, it's a type of Vaishnavism. And yes, Vishishtad, uh, Sri Vaishnavism as we find it today is, has got the philosophy of Vishishtadvaita the rituals and the sadhana of Pancharatra, 
and also the philosophical musings, uh, you know, and experience, mystical experience of the Alwars and Tamon, you know, now that you've done it. So it has these three things in it, like that. So to a certain extent, it's true that, that, that even Vedanta Deshika in the other book, which SMS Chari writes about Indian philosophical schools, he treats Pancharatra as a separate school to Sri Vaishnavism. So how does the Sri Vaishnavism accept Pancharatra? Yes, Sri Vaishnavism fully accepts Pancharatra because it's a system of worshiping Vishnu. And Vishnu or Kriman Narayana is the supreme in, in, uh, in Sri Vaishnavism. So, um, this analysis may be true to some extent, but it does not invalidate the view that Vaishnavism is an outcome of Vedanta philosophy. Right? The Pancharatra arguments on which the Bhagavata religion is founded have their origin in the Vedas. The Agama Pramanya is a book by Yamunacharya called Agama Pramanya, which Pramanya means a proof, a proof of the arguments. Because why? Shankaracharya did, didn't like the arguments. He wrote against, he decried the Pancharatra arguments. And so Yamunacharya wrote a book in opposition to Shankara's ideas, like that, to prove the validity of the arguments. And we have another, um, for those who are interested, we have another, uh, we have another playlist here on YouTube that people can go to called Agamas in South Indian Vaishnavism, where you can learn specifically about the role that the Pancharatra and the Vaikanasa, the Vishnu Agamas play, and about certain other Agamas too, because there are Shaiva Agamas, Shakta Agamas, Bold Agamas, Jain Agamas. There's so many different types of Agamas. But, the, but specifically the Vishnu Agamas, Vaishnavism, uh, Agamas in South Indian Vaishnavism from the Agama point of view is de dealt with in that book. Here we're dealing with Agamas from the Vaishnava point of view. Okay, so arguments come into Vaishnavism as a part of Vaishnavism in this book. In that book, Vaishnavism comes into arguments in a certain way, right? So we're looking at it from two different directions. So because they're two schools, they're actually two schools. All right, so Agama Pavanya of, of Yamuna, the commentary, the commentary of Ramanuja on the relevant Vedanta Sutras, referring to the Pancharatra religion and the Pancharatra Raksha of Vedanta Deshika, which is also, Vedanta Deshi also wrote another book, which is like Agama Pramanya. So, Yamuna, Ramanuja, and Vedanta Deshi all have written establishing the validity of the Pancharatra Agamas, especially the Pancharatra Agamas, but also other Vaishnava Agamas like Vaikunasa, have been established beyond any doubt that the Pancharatras are of Vedic, Pancharatra Agamas are of Vedic origin. Okay, which is to oppose Shankara's idea that they are not of Vedic origin. This point becomes more evident if we compare Vaishnavism with the older school of Shaivism, uh, another important monotheistic religion. There's a type of monotheistic Shaivism. There's a type of theistic Shaivism, right? There are, there's also athe, you know, uh, Advaita Shaivism. A type, you know, there's a type of Shaivism which is based on non-dualism, but there's also there's a dualistic type of Shaivism also. So we compare Vaishnavism to an older school of Shaivism, another important monotheistic religion. Shaivism is primarily developed on the basis of the teachings contained in the Shaiva arguments, which are as old as the Vaishnava arguments. Nevertheless, it cannot be taken as a religion from the Vedanta because the Shaiva arguments, unlike the Vaishnava arguments, are not claimed even by the ancient Shaivites as of Vedic origin. So do we understand this? There are two religions today, Shaivism and Vaishnavism. They, they both, in Shaivism, there are different schools. There's a personalist school of Shaivism. That personalist monotheistic religion of Shaivism is also based on the Shaiva arguments, the, 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 the methods of worshiping Shiva. However, no Shiva Acharya no Acharya in, uh, of Shaivism has ever claimed that the Shaiva arguments were based on Vedanta, they were based on the Vedantic philosophy. Whereas the complete opposite, we have Yamuna, we have Ramanuja, we have Vedanta Deshita, all proving to us that the, 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 that the Pancharatra arguments and the Vaikanasa arguments are rooted in the Vedas, that they have their basis in Vedanta and the Vedas. Right? This is very important. Like that's the difference between that's the difference between Vishishtadvaita Vaishnavism 
and Vishishta Dreda Shaivism. How can Shaivism be Vishishta Dreda? It really can't be because it's not based on, right? It's not really based on, on the Vedanta, okay? So uh, they're regarded as treatises being independent, uh, having independent divine origin and different from the Vedanta. And he gives a quote here to explain, to, to prove that point. This is obvious from the fact that Advaita Vedanta of Shankara which is the oldest among the living Vedanta schools and, though, and whose followers uh, also worship Shiva, does not have any place in it for Shaivism, right? So Advaita Vedanta, this is a common misconception. People think Advaita, Advaitans or Advaita Vedantas because a lot of them wear, some of them don't wear, some of them wear Uvapundra, right? But many of, many of them wear Basma, they wear um, horizontal tila. That, and that, that seems to be worshiper of Shiva. They seem to be worshippers of Shiva, right? It's just that they, they pick Shiva as a particular deity to worship or Vishnu as a particular deity to worship. They, they, it's not Shaivism. You know, the followers of Shankara are not Shaivites. There are other people who are Shaivites, believe me, and, but they're not Shaivites. They're smartest. So, uh, so, does, so actually... Shankara's philosophy doesn't have any part in it about Shaivism. Shankara also doesn't accept the Shaiva arguments and he doesn't accept just Shaivism, you know, separately from, from these other things as a religion. Presumably some later thinkers, some later thinkers, right? Originally it was like that. Some later thinkers like Sri Kanta in the 14th century, this is the person who copied Ramanuja's philosophy of Vishishta Dvaita and put slapped Shiva on top, slapped the name Shiva on top instead of Narayana, right? He has written, he has written a thing called Shaiva Vishishta Dvaita commentary, which is available in English if anybody wants to read it like that. It's a, it's a commentary on Vedanta Sutras, which, which basically philosophically is very similar to Ramanuja's, but instead of the supreme reality being Narayana, he, ins he insists that the supreme reality is Shiva. And Apaya Dikshita, who came in his Guru Prampara, in his lineage, in the 16th century, also basically was a Shaivite, but adopted the Advaita Vedanta, was a, a, adopted the Advaita Vedanta of Shankar. So after realizing the rift between Vedanta and the religion of Shaivism, so, okay, presumably the later thinkers, such as Sri Kanta, 14th century, and Apayadikshi, the 16th century, after realizing this, after realizing that there's actually a rift, right? have attempted to accord a Vedantic authority to Shaivism by interpreting the Vedanta Sutras in terms of Shiva as the Supreme Being in the books entitled Sri Kanta's Brahma Sutra Bhashya and Apayadikshita Shiva, Shivarka, Mani, Deepika, a commentary on the Bhashya of, uh, of Sri Kanta, right? the commentary of, uh, of Sri Kanta on the Vedanta Sutras. So basically what they tried to do, they tried to do what uh, Yamunacharya, Ramanuja, and Vedanta Deshika did. So Sri Kanta and and uh, and uh, Apaya Diksha, they tried they tried this, to do the same thing. What Yamunacharya, Ramanuja, and uh, and Vedanta Deshika did was they proved they proved that Vaishnavism and uh, and Pancharatra Agama has a relationship and has sprung out of uh, has a Vedic origin, has a Vedantic origin, yeah, Vedic origin. Whereas the Shaivites, it took them up to the 14th and the 16th century to realize they needed to try to prove that too about Shaivism. Otherwise, nobody would accept it as having a proper Vedantic philosophy, right? And they tried in their two books, the, their Brahma Sutra Bhasha and, uh, and their uh, Shivarka Mani Dibhika, right? These efforts made at a later period with sectarian bias at a time when open clashes had developed between the two rival religions in South India, Shaivism and Vaishnavism, open clashes between these two, right? In those, in those days, 14th to 16th century, right? Are not of much relevance to establish the basic fact whether or not a particular ancient religious cult was the outcome of Vedanta, right? So what he's saying is it, the, the efforts by those people, what, when did Ramanuja, Ramanu, Yamuna Ramanuja, Yamuna was 10th century, 900s, right? Yamuna uh, Ramanuja was 11th century, right? 10th and 11th century, right? the 1000s. And uh, Vedanta Deshika was, um, you know, 
14th century, right? Uh, you know, 1300s like that. So even when Vedanta Deshi, you know, the Shaivites had just begun with Shri, Shri, uh, Shri, uh, Shri Kanta. They had just begun to try and prove their point when, when all of the, the Vaishnavas had already proved their point. See? Okay. So these later efforts made a lot, uh, these efforts made a lot, much later period with sectarian bias at a time when open clashes had developed between the two rival religions are not of much relevance to establish the basic fact whether or not a particular religious, ancient religious cult is the outcome of Vedanta. We do not face a, a similar problem in the case of Vishishtabrata Vedanta and its complementary Vaishnava religion, as he mentioned before, because of the, the, the strong evidence that uh, Yamuna Ramanuja and Vedanta Deshika have given for the validity, the Vedic origin, and the Vedantic validity of, of, of Vaishnavism and Pantra Dragamas. We do not face that. So that, that, that problem. Historically, the two have grown together as two facets of, of one and the same school of thought from the ancient past. So from, the anci from ancient times, right, this, uh, this Vedanta and Vaishnavism have been associated with each other. We may therefore make a, free, a claim free from dogmatic assertion that Vaishnavism is a religion which, which has developed out of Vedanta and has thus a strong philosophical foundation a strong philosophic foundation, a few lines of, of explanation may be necessary to substantiate this conclusion. Okay, so now that he's made this conclusion, he's going to try to substantiate it, right? He's going to give some proof here of what he's just said, right? Because it's a big, you know, it's a big statement here to say, you know, so let's let him see, see if he can prove it. The main topics of Vedanta are tattva, or reality, hita, or the means of realization, and purusharta, the ultimate goal, as we just said, tapa hita purusharta, which can also be further divided into five, which are called the arta panchika. Tattva is divided into two categories, or principles. There are two principles. There's the para and the apara. There's the ultimate, the independent, the self-reliant God, right? And the apara, that which is dependent on God. Right, that which is dependent on the one highest reality. So there's the independent and the dependent, the Swatantra and the uh, and the Paratantra. Right? The the Aparatantra is of two kinds, the sentient beings or individual souls that have consciousness, which we call chit, right? And the material entities or the material matter of the universe, which are non non-sentient in, in character, jada or, or dull matter, right? Which is called achit. As the Swedishvarachar Upanishad states, tattvas or principles are broadly classified into three kinds. In the Swedishvarachar Upanishad, what is the Swedishvarachar Upanishad? The Swedishvarachar Upanishad is, I think, the 11th or 12th Upanishad. It's like within the, the first 12. It's one of the principal ancient Upanishads, right? And so it, 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 uh, well, it, it divides it up into three, divides tattvas into three. So we have a division into two, para and apara, swatantra and paratantra, right? Independent and not independent or totally dependent, right? And here we have in the Swedish Vatara Upanishad division into three. The three divisions, according to Swedish Vatara Upanishad, are bhokta, one who experiences the universe, bhogya, the universe of experience, so the experiencer, the experienced, right? And Preritara, the one who controls the, the other two, right? So Bhokta is Chit, right? Is the individual souls, the Jivatmans, right? Bhogya, the universe, matter, right? Is what, what is enjoyed by them, right? Of the, the universe of our experience. And Preritara, Preritara, right, is the... Is the Supreme, the supreme person who controls both of it, who controls, supports, you know, uh, 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 you know, uplifts, you know, and permeates uh, all of them, right? Those are the two. That is Ishvara, right? Chida Chit Ishvara. Okay. So in the Swedish Upanishad, they don't call it Chida Chit Ishvara. They call it Bhokta, Bhogya, and Preritara. Okay. So these are just other words for the same thing. Right, so we can say, 
we can say the soul, the universe, and God in English. Or we can say Chitta Chidishwara or we, in Sanskrit. Or we can say Bhokta, Bhogya, or Preritara as it's stated in the Upanishad. It's the same principles, the same ideas, right? The language of Vedanta, the three realities, the three tattvas are called Brahman, the supreme being, Jivatman, the individual self, and Jagat, the material universe, right? So Jagat, Jiva, and Ishvara, right? Like that. Or Achit, Chit, At, and Ishvara, right? So in the, in the Vishishta greater terminology, these are called Chit, I mean Ishvara, Chit, and Achit, respectively. Right? Ishra means God, Chit means the soul, Achit means matter. Okay. The three constitute the Tattva Triya. There's a book by Pila Lokacharya called Tattva Triya. And we have studied it and it explains in more detail what these three are and the divisions within these three. Okay. So Tattva Triya or the three truths or the three principles. Right? Differences arise when it, when it comes to the question of determining the relationship between the Paratattva and the Aparatattvas, right? So, so remember, we remember above the first division, the first division that was being made was into two, right? The uh, Aparatattva, uh, 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 Paratattva, and Aparatattva. So, the supreme independent Swatantra and the Paratantra, that which is dependent upon the Supreme. So, which is the Supreme Tattva? The Supreme Tattva is Ishwar or God. God is the Supreme. He's the independent. Which are the dependent Tattvas? Which are the dependent uh, principles? The dependent principles are, first of all, the soul, right? The sentient being or chit, and, and the, uh, the dull matter or the material universe, the achit. So chit, achit are dependent upon Ishwara. The souls and matter of the universe are dependent upon the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord is completely independent from them. Right. These constitute Tapa Triya. All, all the schools of Vedanta have generally accepted the three Tattvas. Difference, differences arise when it comes to the question of determining the relationship between Para and Apara Tattvas, between God on one hand right, the in supremely independent, and on the other hand, the, the dependent souls and matter of the universe, right? The, ish the issues involved are whether all the three are absolutely real, right? Because Shankara says they're not absolutely real. They don't have an absolutely real different reality, but they're all, in fact, one thing. So first, the first question is, are these things different? Are these things actually different things? They, or are they just different ways of looking at the same thing? Right? So the app, first of all, is the question is, are all these all these three have a, do they have an absolute reality? Or whether the the ultimate reality alone is, is absolutely real. Right? While the other two are either phenomenal in character or dependent realities. Right. Well, we know they're dependent realities, but are they ultimately real or not real, right? The souls in the world. So in all the three, if all the three are real, if all the three are real, if God's real, the souls are real, and the world is real, let's say, right? The question also arises as to whether the dependent realities, that is the souls in the universe, are organically related to the independent one or the supreme, God, or in some other way related, right? In some other manner. We get three different, we get three different answers from these basic questions. And thus, three, basically three different answers are there. Thus, we have the three principal schools of Vedanta, Advaita, Vishishta, Dvaita, and Dvaita. Monism, non-dualism, Advaita, Vishishta, Dvaita, qualified non-dualism, or panentheism. Or, or we can say, or organic, uh, pan, uh, organic um, non-dualism, um, or holistic. We can say also holistic uh, non-dualism, Vishishta Dvaita, and Dvaita non-dualism, -dual, uh, dualism, dualism, complete dualism, 
So from an epistemological standpoint, from the, from the standpoint of understanding true knowledge, the system of understanding true knowledge, the schools of Vedanta, there are different schools of Vedanta, right, which we've talked about here, three principal schools, may be classified under three categories. Abedavad, based on logical con concept of non-difference. Abeda, beta means difference. Abeda means non-difference, means oneness. So Abeda Vada, Vada, Vadati means to speak. He speaks, right? So Abeda Vada means people who speak about the oneness of all these three things, right? These three concepts. So, or Beda Vada, people who speak about the difference of these things. So there are some people who, who, can, who emphasize and they always talk about the oneness of reality. And there are other people who always talk about the differences in reality in these three principles in reality, right? Based on the concept of difference. And then beta, beta var. So beta means different, a beta means non-difference. So there, there are people who, who, who emphasize not only the difference, but also the, the oneness. The theory of dif uh, difference come non-difference, right? As a compromise of the two, of the other two views. Right, so there are two. Um, there are two very, um, very um, stark and completely diametrically op opposed views. And one is oneness, and one is difference. And then in between, we have a compromise where we have people who believe in oneness and they believe in difference in different ways. Right. So these are the three ways of looking at Vedanta, because in the Vedanta, in the Upanishads, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the Brahma Sutras. There are statements which appear to say that all these three things, Ish, Chitta, Chidishwara, God, the souls in the world, are all one. And there are also statements which tend to say that they're all different. So which is it? Are they one or different? Or are they a combination of being one in some ways and different in other ways? Right. So these are the three ways of looking at it. Right. The Abhedavada can itself, the Abhedavada again means the, do, the non-dualism or the monistic way or the, 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 the way where we don't see any difference, the oneness, the oneness conception, the oneness conception can itself assume different forms. It may be taken as undifferentiated absolute oneness, which is called tadatnya, right? As in the case of Advaita Vedanta of Shankaracharya. It may also be taken as non-difference or oneness in the sense of organic unity, Right, so the, the the God, the souls, and the universe are like a, in a Venn diagram. We have a big circle which represents God, and we have two little circles which are inside which represent the souls and the, and the and the universe. So the souls and the universe are organically related to God, and they're within God. You know, the souls are within God. The universe is within God. There, God is also within the souls and within the universe. So they're organically related. So Vishishta Dvaita advocates that and it advocates the organic unity of, of everything, right? Not that, they're, not that they're completely one, but they have some underlying oneness to them, these three principles. Right, they're organically related, right? Organically or holistically related. So it may also mean oneness in the sense that only the ultimate reality is independent, Swatantra, and the other two realities, right, though different from each other, are absolutely dependent. So this is Madras philosophy. So yes, the Supreme Person is, is it, he agrees with, with everybody that, that the Supreme Person is completely independent. And the other two realities, the souls and the universe, are dependent upon that reality. But they're absolutely separate. They're real. They're all real, but absolutely real, uh, real and separate, and not not organically related, as is understood in the Shishta Dvaita. So reality is that is independence for tantra, while the other two realities, though different from each other, are absolutely dependent upon paratantra, on the one independent entity, the supreme God, right? as in the case of Madhva's Dvaita Vedanta. So that's Madhva's Dvaita Vedanta. The concept of Veda Veda, right? Veda Veda, right? 
So there are there are different concepts of beta beta also of right. So we have we have absolute monism, absolute oneness, and we have absolute difference. And then in between we have different different understandings of some things are one, some things are different, like that. So those schools in the middle, right? The concept of beta beta or difference and come non-difference is also understood in different ways, giving room for other schools of Vedanta, not just Vishishta Dvaita. Vishishta Dvaita isn't the only school of philosophy which talks about oneness and difference at the same time. Shankar talks about oneness. Madhva talks about dif difference. There are other schools that believe in difference and non-difference. For instance, the Gaudiya school, the Nibarka school, Balava school, you know, uh, they also talk about difference and non-difference in different ways. Okay, so there are also some other schools which are, which are mentioned here, some other older schools called uh, of Bhaskara and Yadava Prakash. And they're specifically called Beta Beta, difference and non-difference. Even, even uh, Nimbarka school is called Svobhavika Beta Beta. Okay, it's, it's a type of Beta Beta. So there are these Beta Beta schools. There's a lot of them. And they all have, they differ slightly on, on, on what's the same and what's different. Okay. This is hardly the place to go into details of these theories, but suffice it to say, and we can, if you want to go into the details of these theories, a whole of different beta beta schools, that's also covered in his other book, uh, Indian Philosophical Systems, right, where he discusses be the, Yadav, the beta beta schools of Yadav Prakash and Bhaskara. Yadav Prakash was the original Gurukul teacher of Ramanuja, who Ramanuja disagreed with on certain things. But he had a school which was not, he was not a Mayavadi, he was not a Advaitin, he was not a follower of Shankara. He was a Beta Baden. So was Bhaskara previously to him. So this is a different type of Beta Baden. So the, these are two schools of Beta Beta, two of the original schools. This is hardly the place to go into the details of these theories, but suffice it to say that all schools of Vedanta except these three philosophical metaphysical entities, God, the soul, and the physical universe. Regarding the second topic relating to Hita, what's, it, what's Hita? Hita is Upaya, is the means to liberation. Hita is Sadhana, you know, is, 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 a, is how, we, how we worship God, how we attain uh, spiritual uh, realization of God or spiritual knowledge and how we attain liberation. Uh, the main issue, according to the Upanishads, is whether Jnana or knowledge, the spiritual knowledge of Brahman, and or the Upasana, the meditation, on Brahman, on the Supreme, is the direct means to attain spiritual, uh, is sp the Supreme Goal, right? So is it, is it simply jnana or is it simply book knowledge that, that we have to learn to attain the goal or is it actually, actually mean that we have to actually meditate and realize from within, vipassana, right, this knowledge, right? So that's a question. The Advaita Vedanta lays emphasis on jnana, on knowledge, scriptural knowledge. You just study, study, study like that. That is what Shankara and the Advaitins, the Mayavadis, that's what they lay their importance on. Whereas Vishishta Dvaita and Dvaita, these two Vaishnava schools of Ramanuja and Madhva, they give greater importance on, than jnana or book knowledge, right, or, or Shastric knowledge, on Upasana. Upasana meaning meditation on Brahman actually thinking about Brahman, like that, like experiencing. Brahman will, you know, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, for me, knowledge comes. I will give you knowledge. I'm seated within your heart and I give knowledge, like that. So the meditation on certain things is much more important here, according to Vishishta Dvaita and Dvaita, than just book knowledge. Okay, so we're at, uh, okay, so also, also known, right? So this Upasana, or deep meditation, Right, which is known in the yoga school as, as samadhi. It can also be talked that you know, spoken of as anusandana or dhyana, right? Meditation, right? Which is here is called upasana or the, the type of which is mentioned in the Upanishads as upasana. And there are different vidyas. There are 32 of these Upanishadic upasanas, different types of meditation that one can perform to, to realize Brahman, right? Also known as a path of devotion, bhakti yoga, right? Because what is bhakti actually? Bhakti is mental. Although there are so many physical things that we say are, are acts of bhakti yoga, shravanam, kirtanam, vishnu, smaranam, parasevanam, achinam, bandhanam, dasin, zekam, atmanizadam, ultimately, 
the, the, the most important part of all of those things is the internal meditation on God, right? With the upasana or the dhyana or the samadhi, right? Here it's called upasana, right? Also known as, uh, as the path of devotion, bhakti yoga, aided by knowledge and karma and action, dhyana and karma. So dhyana and karma aid us with our upasana or bhakti yoga. Some schools have attempted to, uh, to adopt a combination of jnana, upasana, right, and karma as that of Yadavu Prakash and Bhaskara. So we, we're not going into beta beta vad of, of Yadavu Prakash and Bhaskara, but they, they, they tend to try and mix jnana and upasana and karma all together. The... Regarding the nature of the goal, Purusharta, so we just, that was all talking about sadhana, that was all talking about the upaya, the means, different means, which are taught by in the Gita as Kabi Yoga, Yana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, and uh, ultimately property, surrender. And, uh, and uh, here he's going to be talking about the Purusharta again, the goal. Regarding the nature of the goal, the doctrines advanced by each school vary. So what the goal is, the different schools have a different idea of the goal. Advaita has one idea of the goal. Shankara has one idea. The Ramanujas, you know, the Sri Vaishnavas and Vishishtadvaita have another idea. The Dvaita and uh, Madhvas, they, they have a slightly different idea, right? But what is common to all is the acceptance that the, of the concept of the cessation of bondage leading to the realization of the supreme end. So the bondage in the, of this material body and, and, the, and the repeated birth and death and cycle of samsara, that has to be cut. That has to be stopped. And when that is stopped, that leads to moksha. That leads to the supreme end. So all the schools have that in common. They understand that what liberation means, it means an end to the cycle of birth and death, right? And to bondage in this material world for the soul. And, this, and each one of them, Shankara, Ramanuja, Madhva, they all agree the soul is in bondage and it needs to be free. What happens to it when it's free, they disagree on, but they agree that it has to be free. According to that it's bound right now and it has to be free. According to Vishishtadreda Vedanta, it is the complete and comprehensive realization of Brahman by the individual, of the Supreme by the individual in the transcendental realm. That is the goal. The complete and comprehensive experience of the supreme Brahman by the individual soul in a transcendental realm beyond this world, right? We, that is the goal. If we take into consideration these basic doctrines of Vedanta, we do not find that the religion of Vaishnavism is in any way different from the Vishishta Greta Vedanta. In fact, the former, right, the religion of Vaishnavism, has adopted all the philosophical doctrines of the, of the latter, that is, Vishishta Greta Vedanta. The distinction, however, arises with regard to the manner in which these doctrines have been further expanded and developed without breaking away from the original sources in order to meet certain theological, right, religious, religious needs. The three main topics of Vedanta, Tattva, Hita, and Purusharta, which we've been talking about, right? Principles, uh, means to liberation, and the goal of liberation, have been further expanded to a fivefold scheme of, of categories known as Artha Panchaga. These are, <coughs> here's the five. Also, the name of a book by Hila Lokacharya one of the Sri Vaishnava Acharyas, which we studied. These are the nature of Brahman to be attained, prapya, the nature of the individual self who aspires to realize it, prapta, the method of achieving the goal, praptupaya, remember upaya means it means, four, the nature of the goal, the pala, the fruit, and five, the obstacles in the way of realization of the goal, the prapti virodi, virodi means obstacle. This scheme of classification is adopted on the basis of a verse found in the Harita Samhita, a Pancharatra treatise. Harita Samhita is a Pancharatra treatise. I was just reading a, a verse from Harita Samhita the other day, which talks about uh, Upanayanam, sacred thread, 
um, sacred thread uh, ceremony for ladies. Very interesting. Okay, so Pancharatra Treaties, which claims that has five topic that these five topics encompass the essential teachings of the Vedas, Itihasas, and Puranas. The Vedas meaning. Rig Veda, Yajurveda, Sama Veda, all coming from the original Ekayana, one Veda, Ekayana Shaka Veda. The Itihasas are Ramayana and Mahabharata, which are the histories, and the Puranas, which are usually 18 in number, Mahapuranas. There are some other smaller Puranas called Rupa Puranas. And out of the 18, basically there are six which are considered sattvic, six Rajasic, six Tamasic. The six sattvic ones are the ones which are most important for Vaishnavas. So these are spiritual books. Um, the Vaishnava treaties is frequently quoted, right? The Harita Samhita, right? And have primarily focused their doctrines on these five categories. Of these, the first two are covered by the first and second part of the Vedanta Sutra. The third and fourth categories of sadhana by the sadhana and purusharta sections of Vedanta Sutra, which are the third, second and third. Um, chapters of it on the sutra. The fifth is also covered indirectly in the sadhana part, right? In the part in the in the third chapter of it on the sutra. Nevertheless, it is considered important that an individual should be made aware of how he is caught up in the in bondage and the various kinds of obstacles standing in the way of attaining the final liberation, so that he develops in him a sense of detachment towards worldly pleasures and yearning for moksha or liberation before he embarks on the prescribed path of spiritual discipline. So we should want to, we should have that desire to attain liberation and that will spur us on to adopting, to studying and adopting these different sadhanas, these different uh, methods of, uh, of uh, Kama Yoga, Yana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, different upayas, different methods to attain liberation. Vaishnavism has therefore accorded importance to prapti virodi, the, the, the uh, getting rid of the obstacles to liberation. The three tattvas, again, the three principles, chitta, chitta, and ishra, the souls, the, uh, uh, the universe and God, right, at, referred to in the Swedish Vittar Upanishad becomes part of the fivefold classification. Right, now, uh, exactly the way they were described in Shweshwadara Upanishad again was as, uh, here we go, ba Bhokta, Bhogya, and Preritara. Right, Bhokta, the one who experiences the universe, the soul. Bhogya, the universe, right, who, who he, that he experiences or enjoys. Preritara, the one, one, the supreme person who controls both of those. Okay, just to reiterate our terminology there so we don't get confused. Right, so um, so nevertheless, it's considered important that the individual should be made aware of how he is caught up in bondage and the various kinds of obstacles standing in the way. Um, so Vaishnavism has therefore according importance to Prapti Virodi, the three tattvas referred to in the Swedish Vittara Upanishad, which I just mentioned, become part of the fivefold classification of the Arta Panchika. However, these have been discussed by Vaishnavism in a different manner and in greater detail with emphasis on the theological aspects of the doctrines. This has led to the formulation of certain distinct or distinctive theological doctrines which are not explicitly stated in Vedanta Sutra, right? So if we look in Vedanta Sutra, we will see the mention of the 32 Upanishadic Vidyas that are mentioned in the Upanishads or, or meditations on Brahman and how to attain, attain Brahman. But specifically, the path of property may not be mentioned. However, there is a, one, of the third, one of those 32 Upanishadic vidyas or, or methods of upasana or meditation is called nyasa vidya. That nyasa vidya is property. It is property. So therefore, what, what he's saying here is that particular one is expanded by the Sri Vaishnava Acharyas to, to explain it, to explain property. So 
when you look, if you just look through the Vedanta Sutras, you may not see explicitly, there's the mention of so many different Upasanas, so many different Upanishadic Vidyas, right? There's 32 or 33 of them, as different people say. So mentioned in the Upanishads, right? Um, we may not think, oh, which is the most important one, which is the easiest one, which is the safest one. The Sri Vaishnavacharyas have taken that one, Nyasa Vidya, and they have shown how it's the safest, it's the, it's the surest, it's the easiest. By the elucidation of the above point, we may briefly examine the doctrines of Ishwara, the Sadhana and Moksha in order to find out how these topics are dealt with in the Vaishnava treatises, right? So later Vaishnava Acharyas have written religious treaties, right, that deal with some of these Upanishadic points. Regarding Ishwara, the Vedanta Sutra is concerned primarily in determining the nature of the ultimate reality. It focuses its attention on the criteria for determining a metaphysical entity. Don't worry, this, this introduction is very, very terse and very, very compact. And he's trying to give an overview of the whole subject matter, right? And he's going to go into detail, which is much easier to understand once we get into the actual chapters, right? Okay. It focuses its attention on the criteria for determining a metaphysical entity as the ultimate reality rather than going into the question of whether that reality is Vishnu or Shiva or some other deity. You already mentioned that. Even when it deals with the question of meditation on a specific deity for attaining liberation, the Upanishad merely states in general terms that which is the cause of the universe is to be meditated upon, right? Right? So it doesn't give you the name, right? In many cases in the Upanishads, it just says meditate upon the creator. Who is the creator, right? So it says karanam tu dhyayaha. Dhyayaha means meditate, right? Karanam means the creator, right? The cause. Without mentioning the name of the deity. Though, though for metaphysics, it is immaterial that the name is given to the, for metaphysics or just pure philosophy, it's immaterial what name is given to this reality. It becomes very important for theology or for religion to specify the particular deity which fulfills the criteria of reality and which therefore serves as the appropriate object of worship and contemplation, right? It does not develop any new doctrine which has no basis in Vedanta. On the other hand, it develops the same Vedanta theory by making it more specific by providing a practical guide for religious purpose. Thus, in Vaishnavism, the Brahman, the, sp the supreme spirit of Vedanta philosophy, is identified with a personal god in the name of Vishnu or Narayana, Sriman Narayana, strictly on the authority of the Shruti, meaning the Vedas, as well as the Shruti text, as, and, and well within the framework laid down by Vedanta, as a logical corollary to the acceptance of a personal God, which is a necessity in any theistic system of religion, the supreme being is conceived in Vaishnavism as one empowered with various attributes, such as, these are his Ananta Kalyana Gunas, his, his uh, infinite Supreme attributes, God, omniscience, omnipotence, supreme lordship, compassion, friendly disposition, etc., etc., including a divine bodily form in order to make the transcendental reality a cognizable or knowable object of meditation and worship. With regard to the sadhana or the means of liberation, right? So we talked about the tattva, now we're talking about the hita. Right, the means of liberation. The Vedanta Sutra, following the general trend of the Upanishads, has great, laid great stress on the Upasana or meditation, right, and discusses in detail the seven the several types of vidyas. This is what I was talking about, the 32 Upanishadic vidyas for Brahman realization. Realizing the impracticality of this path of discipline for persons who are not qualified for or pass in the meditation, right? We can't even, you know, we are distracted. You know, if we get a message on our phone, we're distracted. If we see something, for, if we can keep our attention even for a minute on something, it's amazing these days. There's so many distractions, right? 
So how are we going to engage in samadhi, engage in anushmiti, engage in anusandana, engage in constant meditation, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 30, 365 days a year on the Supreme? We can't, right? It's, you know, it's the nature of modern society and modern reality that, that it's very difficult for us to concentrate. The Vaishnava theology, theology advocates Nyasa Vidya, which is one of those Upasanas, Nyasa Vidya, which I mentioned, right? One of the 32 Upanishad Vidyas, or, or self-surrender to God, which is one of the 32 Vidyas laid down in the Upanishads and which is easier to observe, being open to all. See, because, for example, I'll give you another example. There's a Gayatri Vidya. Gayatri is also another one. So the meditation on Gayatri is one. Gayatri is a, is a Vedic verse. So that was only open to male Trivanikas. Brahman Shatriyas and Vaisha males were the ones who were invested with that mantra and they could do the Gayatri Vidya. If you were a foreigner, if you were a woman, if you were a Sudra or something like that, you couldn't do that. So therefore, this Nyasa Vidya is better because everybody can do that, right, in, in any society. So... Okay, so uh, irrespective of caste, creed, and status of the individual, it could be performed, this nyasa vidya, or property. What they're talking about is property or sharanagati, surrender. Here again, it is not a novel doctrine. But some people say this, right? They look at Sri Vaishnava and say it's all based on property, it's all based on surrender. Where's that? Where's that in the Vedas? It's there. The nyasa vidya is there in the Upanishads, Right? And it's being exposed by the Sri Vaishnav, later Sri Vaishnava Acharyas because it's so safe, it's so easy, and it's so sure, right? So um, here, again, it's not a novel doctrine. It's not something that's just made up by, by, by people. It's there in the Vedas, right? Brought into Vaishnavism from elsewhere, but it is a development of the basic theory implicit in the Vedanta. On the subject of Purusharta, so that was about Sadhana, that was about Gita. There's about Upaya, the means. Now we're talking about the goal. On the, on, the, on the subject of the goal, the author of the Vedanta Sutra makes a rationalistic stand. On the strength of the Chandogya Upanishad, another one of the 10 Upanishads, the 10 or 12 major principal Upanishads is the Chandogya. It's a very large Upanishad. He expresses the view that the individual self, after becoming freed from bondage, manifests itself in its true form. This means that after it attains Brahman, it becomes free from the shackles of karma. Once this state is reached, there is no return to mundane existence, which is the last sutra in the Vedanta Sutras. No return, no return. After liberation, there's no return to the cycle of birth and death. There's no return to this world. This concept of moksha, a state in which the individual soul is freed from karma and attains Brahman, is further expanded in Vaishnava theology to include besides a positive state of existence for the jiva, that the jiva just doesn't disappear or merge into God, but he actually exists in liberation as a separate entity, right? Enjoying the bliss of Brahman, the divine service or kind karya to God in the transcendental realm known as Paramapada, the supreme place, the supreme abode of God, also known as Sri Vaikuntha. This has led to the development of the doctrine of Nitya Vibhuti, the eternal, the eternal opulence of God, right? The transcendental spiritual realm, which is picturesque, describe, which is a picturesque, with a picturesque description of Paramapada given by Ramanuja in his Vaikuntha Gadya, right? And the concept of Kainkarya, that the, the, the concept of Kainkarya or worship of the Lord, which is also coming from the Vedas, it's in the Rig Veda, Pasyantis, um, uh, Viva Chaksurata Pasyanti Param Param Tadvishno Param Param Sada Pasyanti Surayaha. The Surayahas, the devotees, they always see God there. They always meditate upon God there. They are, they are engaged in his service there. Right from the Rig Veda. Right? All these may appear, right? Kainkarya or divine service by the released souls. All these may appear to be speculative doctrines conceived by Vaishnava theology to create an interest in devotees seeking liberation. 
So somebody may say, oh, these stories about, you know, this is what the Advaitins will say. When you, when you get liberation, you just merge into the Supreme. There's no reality. There's no separate reality of the Jiva. Or there's, no, there's no service to God. There's no spiritual world. It's all just one homogeneous, you know, Brahman thing. So they say that. And they say all these stories about going to heaven and, and serving God and everything like that in a separate existence and enjoying that bliss of, of divine service. That's all stories. And they say that's all speculation by the Vaishnavas, but it is not so. These theories have come up as an outgrowth of the concept of moksha as outlined in the Vedanta. Thus, Vaishnavism as a monotheistic theistic religion can be proved to have developed on the basis of sound philosophical theories derived from the Upanishads of the Vedanta Sutra. Vaishnavism has both a philosophy and a religion, its philosophy is the same as that of Vedanta, and its religion is not basically different from that of Vedanta, except that it has been further expanded to meet theological needs. We shall present in this book the philosophy of Vaishnavism and theology of Vaishnavism separately. The philosophy will be dealt under the following headings. One, the doctrine of the ultimate reality, the doctrine of the individual self, the doctrine of cosmic matter, the doctrine of means or bhakti yoga, the doctrine of goal, moksha. The, 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 and then the theology of Vaishnavism will be discussed under the following headings. Vishnu is the supreme being, one. Two, Vishnu and the goddess Sri. Vishnu and his attributes, three. Four, Vishnu and his incarnations. Five, Vishnu and his nitya vibhuti, the eternal spiritual world. Six, Vishnu and the jiva, uh, or the individual soul. Seven, property or surrender as a means to attain Vishnu. Eight, Vishnu is the supreme goal of life. As an orthodox religious system, Vaishnavism advocates a way of life in involving certain religious practices, sacraments, and cultivation of ethical virtues. As these constitute an important feature of the Vaishnava religion, they are dealt with separately under the following headings. Number one, the role of the acharya or teacher or guru in Vaishnavism. Number two, the sacraments of Vaishnavism, right? The actual religious activities. The, the number three, the religious duties of a Vaishnava, right? The daily duties and occasional duties of a Vaishnava. Number four, the kind karya, the service to God and to the devotees of God, not just worshiping God, not just serving God, but serving his devotees also. And number five, the Vaishnava Dharma. The main objective of presenting the doctrines under separate headings is twofold. The first purpose is to establish the philosophy of Vishishta Dvaita is distinct from the religion of Vishishta Dvaita, though the two are complementary, representing the two facets of the same system, like two sides of one coin, right? We have heads and tails on a coin, but still it's the same coin, it's one coin, two sides of the same thing. The second objective is to delineate the purely theological theories from the philosophical ones and present them with all the relevant details to enable the student of philosophy to understand them in correct perspective and not just consider the theological things as speculations, which have nothing to do with the philosophy. I have felt the necessity to, uh, of such a presentation for the obvious reason that the extensive Vaishnava treatises, particularly those written by the Vaishnava Acharyas in Manipravala language, a mixture of Tamil and Sanskrit, which include the several elaborate commentaries on the hymns of the Alwars, Bhagavad Vishayam, he's talking about, have mixed up Th philosophy and theology. In fact, they are more theological in character than philosophical, as compared with the classics like Sri Vasya of Ramanuja and the works of Vedanta Deshika in Sanskrit, like Nyaya Siddhanjana and Tattva Mukta Kalapa, right, which is being taught by Dr. Alwan now in English on Wednesdays, in Indian Tuesdays in the West and Wednesdays in India. This has created an impression in the minds of some scholars that Vishishta Dvaita is essentially a theology or just a religion without any philosophy rather than a philosophy. With a view to removing this wrong notion, I published a book recently titled The Fundamentals of Vishishta, of Vishishta Dvaita Vedanta, based on a study of Vedanta Deshika's Tattva Mukta Kalapa, which is mainly a philosophical treatise. That book seeks to establish that Vishishta Dvaita is essentially a philosophical system though it includes theology in it. In order to uphold the philosophical character of the system, theological doctrines are generally left out of the scope of that book 
as Vedanta Deshika itself, himself, has done in his type of Mukta Kalapa. As theology is important for a, for a theistic system, I have attempted in the present book to expound the theological doctrine distinctive to Vaishnavism along with the, its philosophy and religious discipline in order to bring out the distinctive the distinction between philosophy and theology. The source books for the study of our subject are far too many. Apart from the Vedas, the principal Upanishads, the Itihasas, Ramayana and Mahabharata, the Vaishnava Puranas, right, which are the Sattvic Puranas, which I mentioned, there are six of them. The Agamas, both Vaikanas and Pancharatra, we have erudite works in Sanskrit attributed to Yamunacharya, Ramanuja, and his illustrious successor Vedanta Deshika. We have also a large number of scholarly treatises written in Manipavala language by Vaishnavacharyas between the 12th and the 15th century. They fall into two categories. A, those that primarily deal with the interpretation of esoteric doctrines and hence are known as the Rahasya Grantas, the secrets, like the Mukshapadi, like Rahasya Triasaram, etc. You know, Chilurai Rahasyangal, you know, all of the different 18 Rahasyas of Vedanta Deshiva, which Tattva Triam and Artapanchigam is also all these. They've got, or they're also called Sampradaya Granthas. They have to do with the tradition. And B, B, those that are in the form of elaborate commentaries, elaborate commentaries, Vyakyanas, on the hymns of the Alwars, the, the Vaishnava saints of India. This is called Bhagavad Vishayam, and the different, the different commentaries on it. A large number of works written in, at the latter period between the 16th and 19th century are mostly in the form of commentaries on the works of earlier Acharya and tracts dealing with certain doctrinal controversies between the two main sects of Vaishnavas, the northern school, Vatagalais, and the, Teng the southern school, the Tengalais. Otherwise, we can call them the Kanchi school and the Sri Randam school, right? The followers of Vedanta Deshika and the followers of Pila Lokacharya and Manavala Mahamuni. The literature that piled up in later years is indeed very extensive and it would run into volumes if one were to write on the subject expounding all the theories in detail as contained in these source books, both in Sanskrit and Manipavala. It is not the objective of this book to write a history of Vaishnavism. Its scope is confined, as already indicated, to present the essential philosophical and theological doctrines of Vaishnavism comprehensively and in a lucid manner so that we can understand them easily. The school of Vaishnavism, which is covered in the present book, is confined to extant scholarly texts of Yamuna, Ramanuja, and his immediate successors like Puresha, Pilan, Parasarabhata, Nanjir, Parivachan Pillai, Bhatsivaracharya, Sudarshana Suri, Pillai Lokacharya, Vedanta Deshika, and Manavalama Muni. These Acharyas who lived during the period from the 10th to the 15th century have developed the philosophical as well as the theological doctrines, taking into their stand on the authority of the Vedas, Upanishads, Itihasas, Vaishnava Puranas, Pancharatra Agamas, and the hymns of the Alwars. What is found in these authoritative source books truly represents the proper Vaishnavism. The treaties, the treatises, which have appeared subsequent to the 15th century are generally in the form of commentaries, glossaries on the Sri Bhasha of Ramanuja, the hymns of the Alwas of the work, and the works of Vedanta Deshika. They cannot be regarded as original works. I have therefore confined my study to the original source books written prior to the 15th century with a view to presenting an objective exposition of the doctrines. I have avoided the mythological episodes from the epics and Puranas generally used in the works of the later Vaishnavacharyas to substantiate their theological concepts. Many other schools of Vaishnavism have come up in the post-Ramanuja period, such as those of Madhva, Nimbarka, Balava, Chaitanya, Ramananda, Jayadev, and Ganeshwar. Ganeshwar, Ganeshwar. These schools are generally the offshoots of the original Vaishnavism as expounded by Ramanuja. They represent different forms of Vaishnava movements, with, which attain popularity in different parts of India and are, in, and are part of the bhakti movement to meet the local social conditions and religious aspirations of the people in the area. I have therefore left them out of the scope of my study except a brief account of them for comparative study. 
So he's mainly emphasizing the study of Vaishnavism from the point of view of the original text of Sri Vaishnavism, but he does bring in these other schools for a comparative study. I have also refrained from the temptation of comparing Vaishnavism with other Hindu monotheistic religions such as Shaivism and Shaktism, and also non-Hindu religions like Christianity and Islam. We can read about, there are other books about that compare all these things. Ramanuja's Vaishnavism is often designated as Sri Vaishnavism to distinguish it from that of Madhva and other religious reformers. It is also described by some scholars as Vaishnavism of South India. These epithets, in my opinion, are misleading as it will give the impression that it is a religion confined to a small sect of a particular region. True Vaishnavism, as will be explained in the next chapter, is the one which has been in existence from the time of the Rig Veda and which has been developed through successive stages over several centuries, culminating in the reformulation as a systematized philosophy of religion at the hands of Ramanuja. That Vishnu is a supreme deity as associated with the goddess Sri or Lakshmi as his consort is acceptable to all schools of Vaishnavism, though there may be differences in the opinion with regard to the ontological status of the goddess. Hence, it is not necessary to add the prefix Sri to Vaishnavism, except for the purpose of showing veneration to the religion. Nor is it correct to call it the Vaishnavism of Ramanuja or of South India, though Ramanuja, is an, as its exponent, was born in South India. He adopted the Vaishnavism, which was in vogue at that time all over India. The inscriptional evidence, there are inscriptions, ancient inscriptions found in parts of North India, and the fact that North India is the home of some of the important Pancharatra treatises, which constitute one of the main sources of Vaishnavism, demonstrate the prevalence of the religion in other parts of India. It is not, therefore, a, re a regional cult, though it may be widespread in the South since Ramanuja's time due to historical reasons. It is, the, it is in fact, a cult having a universal appeal as it believes that Vishnu is a supreme deity who is imminent in all, and that the worship offered to other deities will ultimately reach him, even as the rain falling from the sky into different streams eventually joins the ocean. That is a famous verse by Shankaracharya. Akashat patitatoyam yitagachitisagaram sarvadeva namaskaraha shri keshavam patigachiti. That's the, the translation of that verse. To my knowledge, this is the first time that, the, that an attempt has been made to present in English and in one single volume a comprehensive account of Vaishnavism, its philosophy, theology, and religious discipline based on original source books. It is my hope that this book may prove useful for students of comparative religion and, in particular, for those who wish to make an in-depth study of Vaishnavism. And there we have the footnotes. That is the end of the the uh, introduction, and we come to the first part, historical development of Vaishnavism. So do we have any questions on the introduction to Vaishnavism, its philosophy, theology, and religious discipline by SNS Chari? I think, I think it was pretty clear. I think he went over, he and I both, we went, we went over multiple times these, these uh, concepts, the concepts in there, the difference between religion and philosophy, the, 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 the division of the ideas into three, Tattvahita and Prasharta into five, Arta Panchika, in, you know, and, and what, what they all mean, the, the Vedantic um, nature of Vaishnavism and the origin of Vaishnavism and how Shaivism and some other, um, some other cults are not, uh, not based in Vedanta. So, you know, so I think, I think it's, it's all very, very clear. And uh, we're going to get into the details now. That was very terse and very difficult uh, because he was trying to cover the whole subject of the whole book. In one introduction, and he he's done that. Ooh,